Hello everyone, my name is Camilla from Canfit Pro, and today we're welcoming back Kathy Perez, one of our favorite presenters. How are you, Kathy? I am well, Camilla. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so thrilled again to be here. It's been like a whole month. I feel like it's been forever. <laughs> I know. See, I feel like it was just yesterday. Yes. But thank you so much for having me back. I'm so appreciative. So, Kathy, um, I believe you live in Arizona. How? What's the weather like now? So, it, it will be about over 40 um, Celsius today. So, it's going to be a little warm. <laughs> but, you know, that's what we expect. And it's a dry heat, so I'm not going to complain. It's when we get the monsoons that it becomes rather hot. Hi, I'm from Calgary. So, I, I, I can only say that I'm just happy to be inside right now. <laughs> Definitely. So as people are coming in, if you guys could let us know maybe where you're from and what the weather is like in your area. Southern. So, oh, Southern. Oh, Southern Ontario, nice. <laughs> for Ontario, for the East Coast. Thank John, the, rainy the West Coast. <laughs> St. Albert. Hi, Tracy. Yay. Hi, Jennifer. Calgary. Calgary. Nice. Ottawa. Ottawa. Toronto. Hi, Debbie. Let's hear it for Ottawa. Way to go. Newfoundland. Oh, raining in Newfoundland. Oh, wow. Montreal. Oh, Montreal. Yes, Toronto is. Awesome. Lovely. I woke up with some birds today, so I was very happy to hear them. Oh, Arizona! Right, Gloria. Arizona. Yay, Gloria! <laughs> I believe that's my Nana, so thank you, hon. <laughs> Vancouver! Woo! I love Gloria. Vancouver. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, I'm really excited, and it's going to be a lot of fun. And I expect a lot of questions. So whoever's coming in right now, um, I don't have a problem going um, for questions during the presentation. That's what I want, actually. Yep, so if you guys have any questions, just please type them in the chat at any time. And then um, as Kathy's talking, if you have a question about her topic, I will I'll just ask her the question during the webinar. <laughs> So if you guys could even leave a comment now, um, something you want Kathy to talk about as it relates to decluttering and mental health, especially during COVID. I know we're all stuck at home for the most part. I know I have some things to declutter as I was telling Kathy. <laughs> so um, just think about anything you wanna ask Kathy about decluttering and mental wellness. And we'll begin shortly. Where did she okay. Where did yeah, I'll speak about that. And I apologize if you hear background noise, it's my AC, my air conditioner. It's running really hard today, so forgive it. <laughs> but I will just project. <laughs> I will be loud. So it is 11.30. We're going to start. So welcome, Kathy, once again. Um, so Kathy is a certified wellness coach and a certified KonMari consultant, which is great. And Kathy's here to tell us about Decluttering and mental health during COVID-19. So Kathy, we're gonna let you take it away. Thank you so much, Camilla, I appreciate it. So everyone, welcome. And um, definitely, I wanna make this as interactive as possible. So please, as you're asking questions, uh, Camilla will interrupt and ask the questions. But the more questions, the better. So a little bit about me. So I, yes, have actually always been an organizing freak. And I am okay with that. That's how I made my living in administration, HR, um, even in, in my current sales, um, I, being organized has always been a part of me. And I've actually also dealt with anxiety disorder. And I wanna bring that up because it's important right now. All of us are living in a traumatic time and it's important to recognize and to understand that our mental stability is quite important. It's as important as our physical. And we're all here as health professionals, you know, in the fitness industry, wellness, well-being. So we already, I'm talking to the choir, right? Preaching to the choir. But I want you to understand that from my point of view, the reason why this is important is because 
I deal with anxiety. And back in 2001, I was diagnosed. And it's funny because even though I was organized, I was holding on to a lot of stuff. It was organized. So you can be organized, i.e. you can be tidy and still have a lot of stuff that isn't serving you. So that was me. So um, again, um, I've always dealt with anxiety, but I've been episode three since 2012. Thank you. And I'm very um, grateful for that. So ever since 2010, um, or I should say, you know, ever since I was diagnosed with anxiety, I've been trying to find ways to, you know, basically take it down, you know, take that anxiety neutral stress level down. Well, fast forward a long way to 2017, and it was great because I was told about Marie Kondo's book, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. And again, I've always been tidy, but when I started reading this book, it was phenomenal. And I was just like, this is it. This is how I'm going to make sure my lifestyle is more in tune to what I want. So it was great. So again, I've always used fitness and organizing to keep me sane. But this book, this method totally changed my lifestyle. It was amazing. So um, really quick and dirty, um, the, the try, the, I guess you can say the journey to becoming um, certified and, and yes, we, we do exist. Come our consultants that we're certified and it's great. So I read the books and I'm like, Oh my gosh, I want her newsletter, Marie Kondo. And then the funniest thing is I found out you can actually learn this method and then, you know, be organizing, helping other people. Organize. So I did, I took on the um, certification process. It was quite the lengthy process. I won't go into that per se. So question time. And then voila, now I'm helping people mentally though because i want to focus on why this is so important on a mental level um i'll go ahead now and explain marie kondo if you're not sure who she is marie kondo she's awesome she's about this big but she is powerful she is this gracious and very humble person but her aura her spirit is so powerful and that's because she has such clarity in her life right so marie kondo she is from um she is from japan and when her books took off in the States, that's when everything just blew up. So her and her family actually relocated to California, and that is where they now reside. So as I was saying, I got certified as a Karma consultant. Well, when she realized that her mantra and her goal of organizing the world was not going to just happen with her alone, she then decided to take on the idea of, I want to bring up people who do what I do. And that's how the certification to be a Karma consultant happened. So in 2017, I went through that and then I started to help people. But right away, like I told you, once I went through my own tiny festival, when I first tidied up myself, my anxiety like dissipated a whole lot. I mean, it was already low to begin with. Obviously I've been doing everything I can um, to be episode free, but what it did was it gave me so much focus and productivity that there was no room to be um, full of anxiety. So a little bit, um, as to why this method, the Kamar method of organizing, um, by the way, I do get to say that legally, Marie Kondo is the creator of the Kamar method, and this is my version of it, okay? <laughs> so feel free to read the books, they're awesome. And there's a new book, um, Joy at Work, so that is phenomenal. I already read it, it's wonderful, go for it. All right, so Marie Kondo, she went ahead and created this method. And it's the disruptor in the organizing industry because what she did, and I want you to understand this, she took something mundane like organizing and she raised it to a level that has never seen, been seen before. And she took it to a mental level. She took it to the, and again, we've always known science-wise has proven that, you know, when we have untidy places, our brains will feel that, will see that and it becomes chaotic, right? So it's important that you understand that being organized isn't just about, oh, I want things to look great and you know really cute and everything. No, no, no. It's actually about helping your headspace stay open so that you can be focused and productive. And so with that said, she came up with this extraordinary system and I call it a system, write that down. It's a system because when you have systems in your life, as we all know, as um, health professionals, fitness professionals, health professionals, it is so important that we have systems in place to help our clients. This is a system of organizing and you can duplicate it and then your life is easier. So write that down, systems equal easy, right? <laughs> so it is a system of organizing that will duplicate 
my eight-year-old niece learned how to do this, right? And it serves her now. So it's something that will serve you hereafter once you've learned it. So the system is quite extraordinary. There are four different components to this organizing system, and this is what makes it so important. So the first one, the main one, is the joy check. So anyone who's seen the tying up um, with Marie on Netflix, it's a great series. I highly suggest it. It's really fun. But they got a good audience, got a good glimpse of what it's like to go through their own tying festival. So the joy check that probably looked a little weird to us in the Western world. And understand this again, I told you that Marie Kondo is from Japan. So everything about this method is actually centered around her culture. Okay, so it's a it's a cultural benefit to us because we're getting a different perspective, right? So the joy check, the joy check is actually quite phenomenal, but it's only basically a gratitude practice. Okay, so all of us think about gratitude practices like I have my own, I have two different ones, um, but they're definitely more men. Uh, I would say I guess mental, right? It's in my head. This is an actual physical gratitude practice, meaning that the joy check happens throughout the tithing festival. And this is why it's so important. So gratitude, we don't think about gratitude necessarily, I think in the Western world in the same way, but because of the joy check, that is why your brain gets a rest. And why is that? Because the joy check is all about gratitude. And when you have gratitude and write this down, when you have gratitude, you do not have guilt, or at least your guilt is not so misplaced. Okay. So I believe <laughs> big time that when you have a lot more joy in your life, when you're happier, I mean, you can all test this. Again, we're in the wellness field. We know that when we have those happy endorphins going on, that we don't have so much bad energy, right? And so that's important to understand. The joy check is essential. And it happens throughout the course of the, the system, okay? So the joy check is number one. Then you have component number two. And this is another reason why this method is a dis a disruptor in the organized industry. So we organize with this method by category. Write that down. Go ahead, write that down. Category. We organize by category and not location. So if you've been organizing, say, for the last five years, and yet your same places don't look any different, that's probably why. Do you, Camilla, yes. So sorry to interrupt, but as you're talking about the steps and that there's not a particular place to start, we did have a question. Um, yes. Do we start with a particular room or like how do we start the decluttering? Because a lot of us live in houses and we have many rooms. Um, so if you could please tell us a bit more about that. Yes, actually you have the perfect segue. I don't think you might've been reading my mind. <laughs> So that's exactly what the category is all about. So Marie has simplified your life to five categories. All right, there's five. So it's not about location. Remember, it's about categories. And those categories are as follows. Go ahead and write this down. You have first clothing, okay? And then you have books. And then you have paper, everyone's favorite, paper. Then you have miscellaneous. And then you have sentimental items. Okay, I'll say that again. You have clothing, books, paper, miscellaneous, and then you have sentimental items. So instead of thinking of your home by location, you've now basically simplified your life to five categories. And that's pretty awesome. Right there, your brain is saying, wow, I can relax a lot more. So those are in order as they are for a reason. And this is important. So that joy check I was talking about, the joy check goes in that order. So every category you're gonna joy check. Yes, even paper, you're gonna joy check. <laughs> so to answer Camille's question, again, it's not about location. We're not going room to room. What we're doing is we're going collectively, just like if you saw the tidying up show, we're gonna first take all our clothing, and I mean all your clothing, and we're going to put it in one pile. And it's for shock value. But don't worry, you don't necessarily have to do it all at once, right? You could do it in, in subcategories to make it easier. And then what you do is you apply the joy check. So the joy check happens on everything. And I mean everything, accessories, shoes, uh, you know, everything. So you actually take the item, i.e. you put it in your hand, you place it to your heart if you wish, 
And it's going to feel a little weird. Again, this is not something that the Western world does very often. And so we pulled it to us and then we actually close our eyes if you feel the need and say, does this bring me joy? Does this make me happy? And guess what? Because our clothing is on us all the time, it's a lot easier to figure out if you like something, right? So I'm wearing my favorite dress. It was easy for me to say, I'm never getting good at rid of this dress. So the same thing happens when you're joy checking everything. The reason why you're going in that order is because it's a lot easier for us to discern if we like something that is clothing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Another question? So building on uh, these five categories, Kathy, Bonnie asked a great question. Where would you put tools and equipment? Yes, so clothing will include um, shoes, um, any type of accessories you can think of um, that can include hats, bags, jewelry. Um, it can include makeup. So anything that you collectively put on yourself is considered clothing, just to put that in perspective. So hopefully that answered the question. But clothing is everything that you put on you. Um, and where would we put things like tools or equipment or kitchen stuff? Like where, where would that fit in? That would likely be in the miscellaneous. So you can already understand miscellaneous is going to be a huge category. All right. So anything that's not in those other four categories becomes miscellaneous. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Any other Thank questions? You, Kathy. Okay. Cool. So um, again, we're going through each category and we're joy checking everything. And um, to the question we just had, again, anything that is not in those four categories, i.e. if it's not a piece of clothing or accessory to clothing, if it's not a book, if it's not paper, if it's not a sentimental item, which can be anything, right? Then it's going to be kimono or miscellaneous and we get to collectively find out subcategories. So once you've gone through all these categories, that's in fact how you're going to joy check. So you're going to joy check and you're going to joy check. When you get to paper, it's not so much about joy checking. However, yes, you are going to go through each and every paper. Why? Because we get to understand what's important to us. So in the paper category, it's not about joy checking as much as it is about, is this paper serving me? I, I, do I actually get to keep it because it has an importance? And it's really cool because in the KonMari method, if Marie had her way, there'd be no paper, right? But in the, cat, in the category of paper, when you're collectively putting everything together, your, your goal is to actually put every paper you can into just three subcategories, and you can write this down, and that would be uh, important, okay? Then you have other, and then you have pending. And I want you to actually visualize all your paper, right? But what I also want you to think about is your digital paper, because this is all about simplifying your life. So again, when you have less to think about, your brain can concentrate better and it will focus better and you will be so productive. Why? Because there's nothing distracting. So paper is pretty mundane, but you can get through it. And then you get to miscellaneous. And again, miscellaneous is a huge category, but are you joy checking? Yes, you are. But the joy check, you've honed your joy checking skill now. You've gone from not knowing what it means with your clothing, per se, and then you went through books, which can be pretty taxing because people are attached to their books. And then you move into paper, which is pretty boring, but you're still going to go through it. So by miscellaneous, you have this um, honed ability to, to instinctively know what's important to you. And again, the joy check is happening this whole time. So you're your, your gratitude meter is going up and going up and going up. And you start to realize what's so important is that, is this item serving me in any way? And that can be, I just love it and it's gonna stay with me. Or, you know what? I have five pairs of scissors. Do I really need five pairs of scissors? Probably not. So then, by the time you get to sentimental, you might get where I'm going with this. By the time you get to sentimental items, which could have been stuff that you had in clothing, could have been in books, could have been in paper. That all ends up in the sentimental category. So you can see what's happening here. Your, your world, your personal space has been simplified already to five categories. Then you're asking your brain, you're asking your body as a whole, how does this item make me feel? So when you get to sentimental items, you're left with the ability 
to discern very um, guilt-free what you want to keep as sentimental. And that is key. So understand this. I told you earlier, the key to the joy check is no guilt. Yes, Camilla. So we're getting a lot of questions, which is great. Um, the first question is, um, you mentioned the order of the five uh, categories and the first category was clothing. So is yes. there a particular reason, like why is the order the way it is or? Yes, absolutely. So the joy check, which is um, the first big component of the method, we want to joy check and we want to learn how to joy check. So we go in this order of those categories for a reason, because um, again, we wear clothes all the time, right? Most of us do. And so it's easy for us to discern if we like something. So joy to us can mean a lot of different things, but it was the closest, um, I guess you could say literal translation, right? So if it helps, you can say, okay, I love this dress, right? This brings me joy. So I'm gonna keep it. Now there's a shirt that I haven't worn in three years. And so I'm looking at it, I'm holding it. I'm like, mm, maybe, maybe not. Well, then you can ask yourself, when was the last time I wore this? Or, hmm, does it even still fit me? So the joy check is a lot easier with clothing because we're, we're more accessible with it. We're, we use it all the time. Then the joy check gets better when you go to books and you're actually getting faster at it. And you, you have a, a better aptitude for deciding what you want. And it's all about serving you. Do I like it? Do I want to keep it? but does it have a purpose? And that's huge. So you can still keep an item, even if it's not doing anything for you, but if it's a beautiful picture and you love it, that's bringing you joy, right? So the joy check happens, and the reason why we go in that order is simply because it's easier to discern if you like something in the clothing category. Then you get a little better, then you go to books, then you get a little better, then you get to paper, which really doesn't take much. But the idea is that by the time you get to sentimental items, you're not gonna have guilt making your decisions anymore. Hopefully that helps. Absolutely. Yes, thank you, Kathy. Um, we have another question. So you yes. talk about joy and the joy check and if things bring me in particular joy about the things that I wear. But Jessica asked a great question. Um, how can you joy check if you have to, if you have clutter from, from everyone in the house? Like what do you do? Let's say nobody else does any cleaning. What, what do you do in that case? Right, so um, um, the funny thing about this this method, I should say, and it's not funny, but it's more um, a very interesting aspect of it, is that let's say that person who asked the question wanted to go through the Titan Festival. They can do that. However, and this is, again, knowing that you have other people in the household, understand that you're only organizing your stuff, okay? So if you're the head of the household, then yeah, you're going to get to organize everything, like the kitchen, you know, what's ever in the kitchen, what's ever in the garage. But understand that if you have like a spouse or other people living with you, you don't get to touch their stuff. So if they have separate rooms, that's their stuff. And it's important to understand that this is the ripple effect. And I was going to talk about this earlier, but I can bring it up now. When you take this on, this type of organizing system for yourself, for yourself, understand for you, this becomes the ripple effect. And we all seen it, right? We do something positive and then that has that ripple effect. Well, this is energy and it's coming from our brains mentally and it's coming from us bodily it is like our energy our positive energy is coming out so when we're going through this process it's just we're we're going through our own you know our own items but what's happening is that that ripple effect is going to happen and people are going to see wow your closet looks really cool that's pretty awesome or i can't believe how calm you appear now and this is no joke. I just had a client who finished my program and her anxiety and her like just being changed completely. And so her friends that she walked with noticed, she's like, how are you so calm? We're in the middle of a pandemic. And she's like, I feel perfectly great. I feel so calm and I feel so serene. So again, it's all about just keeping yourself knowledgeable and realizing that what you're doing, it's having that ripple effect. And it's extraordinary what it does. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so I, any more questions? And then so, yes, we have a lot of questions. I'm just gonna go for asking them. Um, so you mentioned again on the topic of joy specifically, Lauren wants to know, is there a difference when I say 
does this bring me joy versus saying, is this item serving me? For instance, uh, joy means happiness, but maybe something like tax files, they're not joyful, but you know, I need to keep them. <laughs> so can you please tell us a bit more about that? Right, so it's actually pretty, exactly how you explained it. Something that makes us joyful might not actually serve us, but it makes me happy. So, you know, I have a pair of pants that I didn't get to wear for five years, but I kept them because I'm like, no, that's my motivation and I love those pants. So I kept them. It didn't serve me to keep them per se, but it was my motivation, right? Same thing can happen with your taxes. So digitally, I hope that you're making, one point I do wanna get across no matter what, whatever you have in paper form, I want you to digitize that stuff and then decide if you really need the paper copy, okay? But anyway, so let's take paper. Um, does paper bring us joy? Maybe if it's like our journals that it has our personal you know, dreams in it, maybe um, it's a wonderful letter we have when people wrote letters, <laughs> but it's something that makes us happy. It, we can feel that vibration, so that's fine, keep it. What about tax forms? What about estate? planning. Well, guess what? That's called a living document and you get to keep it. Yes, you can digitize it, but you actually need to keep it because it has to be executed at which time it's necessary, right? So it's a living document. You can't get rid of it. So is that serving me? Yeah, it's serving me. I don't have a attachment to it emotionally, but on the level of I need to keep it because it's important, then yes, I'm going to keep it. So it's not going to bring me joy, but it is serving me. So the same um, idea with scissors. You know, I have five pairs of scissors. Unless I'm like maybe like bringing in people to my house and having a big craft, you know, party, I probably don't need five pairs of scissors. So it's about understanding. It's not so much necessarily about, you know, I always have to feel like I joy and happiness about this object. It's about is this object serving me? And how is it serving me? And when can I let it go? Right. But it's it's all about understanding that joy is going to mean different things to other to different people right so it's important to understand that your clothing brings you happiness brings you joy the scissors may not necessarily bring you joy but they serve you and so you're going to keep them and be grateful that you have them okay so hopefully that um, answers the question a little bit um yes that was a great answer kathy so you also mentioned um digitizing papers and digital information and things like that so someone wants to know if the Marie Kondo method or if anything related to her talks about the volume of digital information we store and read on our phones and all the apps we have on our phones. I know I have a lot of tabs open. So <laughs> I'm wondering if you could um, go into more detail about the digital aspect of the Marie Kondo. Absolutely. So I'm glad you brought that up. Again, I'm a bit, so a lot of people might think and confuse the Kamari method with minimalism. It really isn't because it, it drives me nuts actually that it's not really, but what it is is I have to be okay if one of my clients says, you know what, I'm not going to get rid of anything. I'm like, I get to be okay with that. However, big caveat here, you get to find a home from it for it. And that's the next step in the um, process of the third component. But to answer your question, digital um, clutter is just as annoying and harmful to your brain's productivity as physical clutter, right? So when it comes to digital, she would love to have you, and I don't know if I necessarily agree totally with it, but I do agree with the fact that the less you have on your screen, let's say on your phone, the less you have um, things jumping out at you, let's say your, your desktop on your laptop has all these files everywhere. Well, that's clutter and it just happens to be digital. So actually I think it's worse because you can't find anything, right? So important to Marie is order because you wanna be able to give everything a home, right? And that's actually a good lead into the next category, which is you've sorted everything, and I'll, I'll keep going with the question here, but you keep, you sorted everything, i.e. you joy checked everything through all those um, categories, and now you're ready to give everything a home. So that's the third component of this method. So the first one was joy check, the second one was um, organize a category, and now we're in um, give everything a home. Your digital files deserve a home and they need to be as organized as possible. So think about any type of filing system where you have folders and you have subfolders. It's no different than the physical version, 
but think about what's the best. And again, if you could actually break down your digital files, I know this won't necessarily work for everyone, but if you could think about those three subcategories of paper, important, other, and pending. So pending is any active task you have, right? So maybe you have a pending folder on your desktop and only the desktop. Then you have those important and other sad categories hidden away somewhere, right? It doesn't matter where, but when you have, so like, um, I'm not, I won't necessarily take my phone, but if you were to look at my phone screen, I have folders on my screen because I have a picture and it's my dream vision. And I don't want ever clutter to have me not see that on my phone because what, we're looking at our phones all day, right? So I have a picture and to make it clear, I have all these folders that then I put all my apps in. So if you learn nothing else today, then after this, I want you to go through your phone and I want you to delete any apps that you have not used in the last say year. And I say year because I, you know, I have a Tabitha um, app, but how often do I do Tabitha? I don't do it that often when I'm exercising, but when I need it, I have it. So only keep what you know is serving you, i.e. do that, do that joy check with your phone, okay? Do that. If you do nothing else after this, I want you to, to joy check your phone, <laughs> especially right now. So hopefully that, that got your question answered a little bit. But everything finds a home. So before that, you were sorting everything and then you kind of had stuff in maybe piles, you had temporary storage. Well, now you're giving everything a home. And that's important because when you give everything home, again, this is about gratitude, right? So once you decided what you're gonna keep, what's serving you, then you get to give it a home. And what does that mean? Well, now you know where that pair of scissors is every single moment of every single day, okay? And I'm gonna bring this up statistically. So when everything finds a home, you're not wasting, on average, 55 minutes a day looking for something. Now that statistic is for based in the US, but if you can imagine, 55 minutes of your day on average is wasted simply looking for something. We all know about our fight or flight. Well, when we can't find something, our body doesn't recognize that it's not a life or death situation. It just knows, oh my gosh, I'm feeling nervous. Well, I just can't find those scissors, but yet my body is telling me I'm gonna shoot up my cortisol so that I can get ready for anything. No, that's a constant state of, of not only anxiety and so that takes your anxiety up but that's a constant state of fear and that's not good and we all know right now we do not need more anxiety in our lives so everything finds a home so it serves a purpose of helping our brain subconsciously know i know exactly where that pair of scissors is i don't need to think about it i don't need to think about it because what i'm going to use those scissors for is way more important so i'm going to go get the scissors i'm going to use them and guess what i'm going to do i'm going to put them back and even if you don't put them back right away your brain knows that to go from A to B, I get to put the scissors back. Why? Because it knows I want to find the next time. All right, what's the question? Um, we have a lot of questions coming in related to um, your point now about storing things in the house. So mm -hmm. the first question is from Rose. Rose says, I have a lot of bags, boxes, things that I need to find a spot for in the house. How do I overcome having these leftover items at the end of my decluttering? Right, so you've decided what you want, assuming that you went through all the, the first steps, the first three steps. Now you're gonna find everything home. So Maria's very, um, she loves, and this is gonna be a roundabout way to get there, but Maria loves vertical storage. So she wants you to lose anything that's on the floor and push it vertical. So like in my case, in my room, I have that little over the door, um, apparatus so I can put my shoes. So I don't have my shoes on the floor. I have them raised up so they're not encompassing. They're not, you know, obstructing my floor. So what I'm getting at is that when you have all types of, first you would want to sort all those bags and all that good stuff. And if that's what's left over and then you actually decide, okay, I guess I need to save some of this stuff or whatever it is. When you find homes for stuff, what you want to understand is that they get to be a place of honor. So Let's take, and it's so cute because um, I love how she folds and everything, but she wants everything to be shown very beautifully because she wants you to show, give it honor, right? So to those um, question about having all kinds of bags, you really need to ask yourself actually, well, 
have I George checked this? Is it something that I've actually decided I need? If in fact it's something that you desire to keep and that you need to use it, then guess what? You get to find a proper home for it. And when you find that proper home, that's where it's gonna go back each and every time you use it. So let's say that you collectively say, okay, well, I don't have room in my home, but I need to put them in the garage. Well, guess what? No matter where you put them, they, got, they get to be put in such a manner that you're showing it proper respect. I know that sounds funny, but when you give something the proper um, respect and the gratitude, even if it's not the best place to put it, it will be grateful and you won't have, that sounds again, woo woo, but you won't have that energy coming back at you. But if in fact that you, again, she loves the idea of taking things vertical. So whatever space you can take off the floor, or I should say any space that you can clear that's on the floor and take it up vertically, especially in your closets, um, whether it's high cupboards and so forth, do that because then you're raising your vibration. This whole system is about raising your vibration up. And what does that do? That brings you joy. So anything that's going to help you feel happy, that's raising your vibration. So hopefully that makes a little more sense. But, I, you know, I just got this question actually sort of um, in another webinar or podcast. And because we can't actually take our discarded items anywhere, the best we can do is hide them for now. Take them out of your sight because you don't want to put them back um, after you sorted them. But to my point, you know, if it's as simple as simply asking on any type of social media platforms, hey, I want to give this away. I want to give this. You know what? I've seen stuff on my, on my block sidewalks. Blatantly take it. We don't want it anymore. Whatever it takes, as long as it's not hurting anyone, then do that to make sure that whatever you discard is not being dishonored and that you actually are taking it out. So for the time being, I have like five bags me the organizing freak right i have five bags that i can't take them anywhere or at least i can't take them where i want to so i have them tucked away <laughs> um i can see them but not very often so i know they're there and i know i get to take them away but until i can they're going to be safe and they're going to be taken care of i.e i'm showing them respect so everything gets respect and as long as you're putting it in a place that makes sense to you then that's okay so hopefully that was a roundabout way of answering that question <laughs> That's actually perfect, Kathy, because we did have a question um, earlier on. Because the donation centers are closed, what do we do with these things? So I'm glad you actually answered that question as well. Um, so we have two questions from Marilyn and Maggie, kind of two sides of the same coin. So I'll ask one and then I'll ask the other. So Maggie says, I'm a mom and I kept, kept everything from my daughters over the years, like artwork, things from their childhood, like sentimental things. How can I declutter um, and not feel bad of letting go of these sentimental things that bring me joy? So that's a great question. So, um, assuming, so assuming that we have gotten to the sentimental category, your joy checking skills should be pretty honed. And that means that we should not have guilt associated with anything that we own anymore. Now, when it comes to something like that, um, some of the best um, examples that I've seen or heard have to do with recycling um, art, recycling whatever it is the item is. So in this case, a good example um, is, okay, my kids, you know, at school will make um, various artwork every week. Well, what you do is every week you will put it on the refrigerator, right, the new version. But then once you're ready to recycle a new one, you take a picture of the old one and then you gracefully let go of the older version and then you, so it's a recycling mode. So if you can be okay with um, recycling, having that idea of, okay, I'm gonna recycle all of these items, you get to enjoy them. And even if that means you are just taking a picture and then you actually decide to discard them, it's showing gratitude. Understand it's not about what you do with them physically, it's about what they did for you emotionally. I want you to understand that something is affecting you emotionally and it's giving you a feeling that's the important part so whatever physically is there don't be afraid and don't feel guilty about not using it anymore and then giving it away even if that means again recycling it literally in the you know in the recycle bin compost whatever it is but understand that you really 
get to stop thinking about guilt as why you're holding on to something. I can assure you that any person only wants you to feel that initial thank you. They just want to hear you say thank you. I'm grateful for what you did for me, what you gave me. And even a little child will understand, okay, mommy took a picture of this or daddy, you know, totally it was awesome, but now I'm ready and I can give it away. So hopefully that helps a little. <laughs> Yes, so the other side of that, and you you kind of touched on it already. Um, this is a great question, actually, from Marilyn. How do we handle gifts that we get, but we don't like them, but we keep them with us? What, 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 what advice do you have for those kinds of things? So that's a great question, actually, <laughs> and I get that a lot. Um, okay, so here's my, and uh, Marie actually talks about this in a little bit in a roundabout way but in my view when you have items that you may not be using but you want to hold on to them and you want to fix them or you know you're going to get to them give yourself a time period and i literally mean this like give your yourself a goal of when to get this item fixed when to get it um taken care of when to decide what to do with it because it's just going to linger and that's negative energy we don't want negative energy so whenever we can give some or rather when we can't decide what to do with something or we are putting it off i don't want procrastination to be the reason why you keep something so give yourself an actual date okay by next week next friday i'm gonna mend this button i'm going to you know repolish these shoes whatever it is but give yourself a distinct date because that will make your brain understand okay this item is not hanging out forever it has a purpose and i'm going to fix it or i'm going to give it to someone or whatever it is so understand that your brain loves, basically you're gamifying what you're doing, right? You're gamifying your time. So your brain loves understanding, oh, I get to fix this task, I get to finish it, and then it's out of my sight. Use that as your motivation because your brain loves challenges like that. And the faster you can get through something, the quicker you're gonna feel more joy. <laughs> so hopefully that helps a little. Um, so I know you mentioned um, in the previous comment that, you know, if the children's pictures on the fridge, for instance, if you just thank them um, and they understand that, it, you know, what they gave you brought them, brought you joy. Um, and you also mentioned that your niece is now also using this method. Um, so someone did ask, how can I apply the Conmarie method to toddlers so they can grow up to be more organized and mentally ready to handle anything? So that, and that's it, I love that question. And it, it's actually that whole idea of the ripple effect. What we do, others see, right? Um, kids are very absorbent. Like we don't think they see as much as they do, but they pick up on everything. So with that in mind, and we know this again, as wellness professionals, we know this, what we do, our clients are gonna do, right? So when we actually in, understand that everyone's, has the right to how they raise their children. I'm, I'm not here to, I don't have children. So I definitely, I have a niece and nephews that I love to death and I, I try to be the best um, example I can for them. But understand that, again, they see everything you do. So if you want to raise children that have this organization type of mentality, it's not so much mentality, it's about gratitude, right? So go ahead and you know go through your own time festival but then ask your children, hey, did you like seeing mommy do this or daddy do this? Did you like, you know, what this looks like? And if they have any type of interest, go ahead and, and ask, hey, well, let's try to see if you want to do this. Their intention spans are not going to, you know, be quite yours. But the intention that you want them to feel is there. So you can actually, again, my eight-year-old niece understood how to do this a year ago. It's been like maybe two years, but she understood what it means to like something. All kids like stuff, right? So if you can teach them, okay, I love this, or I like this, let's always put it back so that you're showing that you love it. They enjoy that so much because they love their stuff. So then when you teach them, okay, we're going to give it a home. And then when you use it, you get to put it back to the home. They understand that instinctively. Oh, I'm going to give it a home. Then it needs to go home. So when you're going through these steps, it's okay to incorporate, perhaps, again, not forcing, but instilling the same type of ideas with your children or with whomever you're you know wanting again you can't force this on anyone but assuming that these are your children obviously you have a <laughs> you have a right to want to um, bring them up a certain way so 
it's the um, the system is easy enough. Again, it's simple. It's simple enough for a little child to understand. It's not always easy, but the intention is there. So if they see that you put stuff away, if you tell them, hey, let's go ahead and put your toys away, let's do this, it will, it will, they will pick up on that and it will make their lives easier. They will have so much less anxiety. They will have so much less, they will have peace of mind because they, their minds will be so much orderly. So I totally think that however you can try to instill these thoughts, these practices, go for it. You know, you can't fail. I, I don't believe in that. You're, you're teaching them how to respect items. And that in turn will let them understand that every item has a purpose. And at some point I get to maybe donate it. I get to give it to someone else who really needs it. And they really appreciate that. I know my niece was totally touched that she could give away stuff that she didn't use anymore because there were kids that didn't have toys, that there were kids that were foster children that didn't have any parents and that broke her heart. So again, they will understand they're very resilient and they, they just want to be lovable and love others. So I love that, but definitely, yeah, don't, don't get too hard on them, but definitely you can show them by your example. Hopefully that helps. <laughs> Uh, that's great. So I know you mentioned the anxiety. Um, we had an earlier question. Do you have tips on how to avoid feeling overwhelmed when you're starting the process? Because I know a lot of people, let's say they live in big houses or they have so much stuff and I don't know, it feels overwhelming. <laughs> like where do you start? So yeah, so um, the best I can say to that is the fact that when you, okay, so let's say that you even like just watch the shows, right? And then you try to take on this time festival. The important thing is to do the best you can and to finish, like give yourself, and, and again, this is gonna be hard to, to take, but, or to understand, but a tiny festival takes as long as it can, but as quickly as you can. So I repeat that. A tiny festival takes as long as it has to, but as quickly as possible. So we want you to have, um, a, a, a urgency and that's why there's that shock value that's why we put everything in piles like that's why come um Kamara method wants you to throw everything together right but um understand that this is a process and you're going to get better at it once you finish it that's when actually the magic really starts to take hold because now you actually go from now we're in the fourth component actually of the method so we've gone through door checking we've gone through the categories how you use the categories and then um, giving everything a home. And then now your brain, your mind loves the effect that this is having. You now have intention and this is huge. You have intention about every single item in your home. What does that do for you? Well, during these last few months, we've been in lockdown or in shelter in place, whatever you wanna call it. And I can assure you at some point in time, you probably thought to yourself, why is that item there? It's annoying me. Or, oh my gosh, I can't find this or that. And that's upsetting you, right? So intention. Now that you've sorted everything and everything has a home, your brain is like, whoa, not only do I not have to stress at all about where things are, but I see everything so differently. So it changes your perception, not only about your stuff, about your items, but it changes your environment completely. So to that effect, your intention is now whatever I bring in my possession, i.e. in my personal space, in my mental space even, it, it's the KonMari effect, we call it. Everything gets KonMari now. But the intention now is that I am not going to bring anything into my space unless it's serving me. So you actually will KonMari, joy check, literally, anything that you decide. So when I'm on Amazon, when I'm looking at my, you know, my list of items, I'm asking myself inadvertently and subconsciously now, actually, whoa, where am I going to put that? Whoa, um, do I really need that? Do I, can I wait a little bit longer? So there's no more impulse. Your intention is clear. I want focus. I want to be productive and I want less stress. And so your intention is now, okay, if I need this, it's only because I require it completely. And you know, because after going through this tiring festival, you visually, literally visually can see what you have and what you don't have. And that's going to save you money. <laughs> and that's going to save you, most importantly, our most precious resource time. All right, go for it. Um, so you just mentioned money, which is going to bring me to our next great question. Uh, Cynthia wants to know, 
how do you determine what you should sell versus what you should give away? So that is actually, that's a really neat question. And I'm glad that you put it that way. So <laughs> it, it, we all know that we've been all hit financially. The world has been hit financially, right? So I think it's actually, I think it's perfectly okay that if you decided to go through all this, the Titan Festival, and then you come up with all this stuff, sell whatever you can or whatever you think would be a value to people. Because guess what? Someone is willing to pay for it. It doesn't matter what it is, but they will pay for it. Now, um, in the case of, okay, well, maybe, you know, you have a lot of kids toys, or maybe you have stuff that's not in the best, you know, condition. You can decide to either donate that or, you know, do whatever you want with it. But understand that your, your perception of your stuff is your perception. But something that you don't necessarily value so much anymore, someone might dearly want that. So I don't think that you should just credit any of your stuff. If you think you can sell it and you want to take the time because it, it takes time, right? Understand that as long as you're willing to invest the time, go ahead and, and ask for any type of you know, price for it. But when it comes to donating, like all my stuff, it's all stuff that it's going to go to a shelter. Unfortunately, not accepting stuff. So all my stuff, literally, because it's clothing, um, it's um, usable toiletries, blah, 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 that stuff. I'm not just not going to give that away, or I should say, I'm not going to have people buy that, right? Well, that might have been useful two months ago, right? <laughs> Everything was shut down. But I will definitely donate that. Um, anything that I do sell is because it's usable. Like something really wants it. Like, you know, I, I sold a bike recently on um, Facebook. Um, I sold, you know, different items that I know would be useful. Anything that I donate is because I honestly know that, okay, you know what? The shelters, they need these toiletries. They need this. So it is a personal decision, but it's one where do not feel guilty ever, even in these times about selling anything because it is a value to someone and that's what counts. Hope, I think that helps. <laughs> um, that's amazing. So speaking of storing things, Allison wants to know your thoughts on seasonal items like Halloween decorations or winter jackets. What do we do with those things um, when it's not in season? So, so, so <laughs> it's, it's a great question. One that I don't have to deal with so much because in the desert, our, our, you know, our temperatures don't change too often. But in Japan, where they don't have a lot of room and they have that temperate weather, right? They have seasons. They have to literally be able to store their winter clothes somewhere and then vice versa. So to your question, the best way to do that is if you have room, it's okay to leave it out, but you're gonna put it in such a way that it still is um, not, I, I don't wanna say out of sight, but it's, it's not cluttering, so to speak, meaning like if you can actually sort it out into another, say, closet, then what you're using, that's great. But if you don't have the room, then this sounds funny, but there is an actual like method to how she wants you to use your closet space for clothing, um, accessories and everything. If you have enough room, then you would actually still just keep all of your winter stuff together with the current season. But it is such a way that it flows with the rest of the, with the clothing. So again, if you have the room, if you don't have the room, then it's, um, it's important that you do store all that stuff um, however you can, but that it's not in your current location and that it's preferably, if you can, um, like underneath, say like your bed, like she loves, Marie actually does talk about, she wants you to use those air compression bags, right? So anytime you have to store clothes or anything that you can compress, blankets, linens, that kind of thing, she wants you to use those air bags so that you can suck all the air in so it's really small. And then you can literally put them into bins and out of sight, out of mind. Again, out of sight, out of mind. And that might mean, okay, they're in the closet, but they're in all oh, you know, their own little place. They have a place of honor. They're tucked away, but they have a place of honor. So that's about the best I can could give there. <laughs> um, that's a really good answer. Thank you, Kathy. So it's interesting because we have similar question from two people. So one person identifies as a baby boomer and one person identifies as a millennial, but they're both saying um, they've experienced scarcity growing up, so now they have a hard time letting go of things because, like, they're having the anxiety of having the empty space makes them feel like they're lacking. Uh, what would you say to these people? So, I can appreciate that so much. Um, 
especially right now. And that's interesting that it's two generations completely, but they're feeling the same effect. So that was um, quite, quite bold. Um, I think that that tells you how our mentality is. We're feeling scarcity. You know, that's why, you know, people took 20 rolls of toilet paper when they didn't need it, right? But to answer the question, um, I think it's important to understand that that feeling is actually not about the items that you don't have, it's about your own fear. So again, we're in a traumatic situation, just like the baby boomers were um, after World War II, just, well, sort of, right? And then now millennials are like, oh my gosh, I don't have any job. I don't have, you know, literally anything around me. But if you were to actually change that perspective and say, okay, I have this space and it's serving me. How can it best serve me? So instead of thinking of, oh my gosh, I don't have a lot around me, actually ask yourself, what could be in this space that's going to serve me the better? Meaning like, what could I have here? Or what um, can I, yeah, so exactly. What can I have here versus what I'm trying to hold on to that maybe I don't even like? What can I put here that's going to actually serve me and bring me joy? So you might be holding on to stuff that actually has served no purpose. That's not bringing you joy, but you get to check that, right? You get to go through the, the um, joy check and ask yourself, am I holding on to this because I'm scared? Or am I holding on to it because it actually means something to me? If you can take the, the fear out and literally just put the feeling of, is it bringing me joy? Is it making me happy? You might find that it's actually easier to get rid of stuff for sure and only put back anything that's gonna serve you. And I think it's for both ends, you know, whether you're a baby boomer, whether you're a millennial, understanding that it's okay to have a little bit of stuff as long as it's serving you very well, because you can have it. What this teaches you, and I, I would hope that in these last few months, we've understood how very little we actually need to make us happy. We have found out the hard way that we don't need a lot of stuff, but as long as we have our family and that we're healthy, that means a whole heck of a lot. So take that for what it is and just know that whatever you're holding on to or whatever you're feeling scared about, understand that if you can change it and say, okay, how is this making me feel? Is it making me feel happy? If it's not, then maybe it's time to think about, okay, and maybe I should be, you know, gratefully letting it go. So that'd be my perception. <laughs> Um, so you did mention the fear and how the things like you kind of work for them rather than them working for you. So we're almost out of time, but I thought this was a really interesting question. Um, someone said, my husband started collecting stamps. Now it doesn't bring him joy, but he feels compelled to continue collecting them. So now he's a slave to the collection rather than the collection serving him. How would you help him or someone in his situation? Like, what do you do? Like, what do you do now? Yeah, collections are quite interesting. And in that show, Tying Out with Marie Kondo, there's a specific episode where there's a gentleman who has a humongous baseball card collection. And that's sentimental. It's miscellaneous, but it's definitely sentimental. So to answer the question, in that episode, he had to take, it wasn't just overnight. He had to go through this, but he went through each and every one. And he finally came down to like, okay, I don't need all these. These are the ones that bring me joy. So it's the same concept. If, if a collection is no longer serving them, making them happy, they still get to sort, I, you know, they get to go through that sentimental category with it, but they're gonna look at it from the point of view, okay, how much joy is this bringing me? You know, be very cognizant of the fact that that same collection means something different to you than it did 20 years ago. So now you're seeing it from a different pair of eyes. And so there's no guilt. So it's okay if you actually get rid of some of that collection. If you get all of the collection and get rid of it, there can't be any guilt saying, I just spent how much money and now I'm giving it away. No, you could sell it. You could easily give it away. You can, whatever you want to do with it, but there's no guilt anymore because it served you. It made you happy. That's what it was doing. Right now it has served its purpose and now you get to let it go. That's the easiest way to do it. So there you go. <laughs> Great questions, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, so Kathy, final question. Um, a lot of people have been asking us, if you could tell us more about your Conmary certification, is there, like, can we apply for it? How long does it take? Where, where can we go to get, get the certification? So if you could please share some of that with us. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. So um, it is a process. It's not for the faint of heart, but um, 
So what used to be a live seminar is now virtual, I believe. And so I'll just take you through the, what happens. You, if you are interested, you definitely want to go to conmari.com, K-O-N-M-A-R-I, conmari.com, and sign up for their newsletter because they will give announcements as to when they're going to have their certification. So what happens is there is um, a list of um, prerequisites. So you got to make sure you have read the two first books, Tying Up with, uh, I mean, the uh, Life Changing Magic of Tying Up and Spark Joy. And then you get to perform your own tying festival, take pictures, and then what they do is then you apply, and there's a waiting list, but you apply to the seminar. And the seminar, again, used to be live. Now it's on virtual. Then you go through the seminar, and then you take on clients because you have to um, you have to accumulate hours with your clients. And then once you've done that part, then you take an exam. So it's quite the process. It's not you know it's just not okay a one day thing. No, it's it's a process. So I take it seriously. Um, there's probably around 450 of us now in the world. So again, we're going to grow. It's going to grow, but. It's not for the faint of heart, you know, you got to stick with it. So it's worth it though. And it's a lot of fun, but yes, your best resource is conmori.com. And again, everything's being changed quite rapidly because of what we're going through. But I do know um, that they just opened up and they might have already had to have closed it because they can only take so many, but, but yes, that's how it happens. So it's fun. <laughs> thank you so much for that, Kathy. And thank you for speaking to us today about um, emotional decluttering during COVID-19. Um, so a replay will be available. We'll send an email tomorrow with the YouTube link. So everything will be there. So Kathy, thank you so much. Once again, we hope to see you shortly. Um, and we really appreciate the time you've taken to spend time with us today. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm, I'm Camilla. I'm so grateful. And I just love CampFit Pro and every, all the members. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Take care, everyone. Be safe. Thank you so much, everyone. Those were great questions as well. Um, so have a good rest of the day. And I hope we all learned something. I know I'm going to apply some of these techniques to my life um, after the webinars, Kathy knows. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a good rest thank of you. the day.